We've tracked individual cases that we've verified where those internet provider staff have been pressured at gunpoint to actually censor online content. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Surfshark Wave podcast. Back on the show, uh, we have Alp Toker again, uh, one of the founders of NetBlocks. And uh, yeah, how are you doing? I'm doing good. It's great to be here. <laughs> You had uh, a busy week here at Surfshark. So as you can see, he's in the studio. This is one of our first podcasts we're doing actually inside the studio. It's quite a small studio. Yeah, but it's a real place. It's not a it's not a virtual <laughs> screen. It's physically present, which is a good it's thing. physically present. That's right. Um, and today uh, uh, on the show, I want to talk more about uh, sort of my VPN origin story and more to talk uh, as well with you about some of the use cases of a VPN because some people don't realize that a VPN can have so many use cases and maybe not for everyone specifically, but there are places where a VPN I think is crucial and, and sort of mandatory to have in order to have like uh, normal access to the internet. So let me start with my sort of background into VPNs. You know, I think my first VPN was back in 2018, I believe. I remember it was a free VPN, which is a big no-no. Uh, especially nowadays, if you are getting it for the security reasons, because they, you know, the way they make money is that they collect a lot of data, and that's the last thing you want out of VPN, obviously. So I felt this strange feeling when uh, when I realized that ISPs can actually eavesdrop and, and really see what you're doing online, because I think there's a reason why we have, you know, curtains in our homes, right? <laughs> we do we we do it for privacy reasons, and and online, a lot of people just sort of roll with it. Yeah, there's this argument that I have nothing to hide, so oh, yeah. I will just get on there and use it. I don't need any kind of protection. But that's a dangerous approach because the moment you do have something you want to protect, mm -hmm. it might just be something ordinary like your banking or your, your gaming. Uh, but when you do do that, then um, it's probably too late if you switch to a VPN by that point. It makes mm -hmm. sense to have that protection from the get-go. And, and yeah, and exactly. And going back to you know security aspect, this is where the VPN actually um, sparked an interest in routers. Because for the longest time, I was using ISP proprietary routers, or even uh, and I actually purchased uh, a router that I use in every video now, uh, which is the TP-Link Archer C7. Uh, but uh, when I logged into the control panel, I realized there's no features there. Like, so they, like there are some basic features. There's obviously some, uh, some of the parent controls, uh, parental controls and things like that. But overall, actually, uh, it was lacking in uh, the feature front. And especially because I wanted to set up a VPN on it. Yeah, You know, at NetBlocks, we're big fans of OpenWRT. Oh, yeah. So we, we flash <laughs> our, our routers. Nice. Plus it's a Linksys um, WRT router. And that's real natural for this platform. And, you know, it's an open source platform, so you can load your own packages. And I think that's also a useful way to, to load load your VPN. Another like big eye-opening moment for me was uh, the fact that most proprietary routers or just, you know, off-the-shell routers, they, they release so many routers nowadays. It's sort of like, uh, you know, phones, which is another thing we can talk about. Why Android phones are less secure than iPhones? Mm -hmm. It's all about the firmware and what the company ships, right? Yeah, and another reason is because iPhones have a much bigger adoption of the newest uh, software. Mm -hmm. So, uh, say I, you know, iPhone 11, 12, they all are running iOS 16, which is the latest version, and uh, the adoption rate is much quicker because there's just not many devices. I mean, yeah, you have a lot of iPhones, but they're all running the same, you know, uh, basic uh, processor and 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 you know. But I remember I had an old uh, iOS, um, an old Android device, and the vendor wasn't giving updates for that anymore. And I, f I found that the Lineage OS firmware oh, yeah. <laughs> just gave it a new life. And suddenly, you know, it was just going to the bin. And it was back in my pocket after after loading this up. It's really exciting to see the community is kind of building that. Yeah, uh, Lineage OS is great. I've used it as well. I had, a, a, I believe, a Samsung S5. Um, and it also, you know, just because, again, these manufacturers, especially on Android, there's so many manufacturers out there. You know, you got your Xiaomi, Samsung, uh, you got OnePlus as well. There's so many out there. And they release so many devices every year that you just can't keep up on making security updates for it. And that's the same issue on routers, actually, is that they release so many of them, they just forget about it, you know, right? And I don't know how often people replace their routers in general or, or phones for that matter. Uh, but again, same issue. And, and this is where OpenWRT can help. And 
also custom ROMs, like you mentioned, Lineage OS, because it comes with the, the latest uh, firmware. Another big thing is like unsecure public Wi-Fi's, uh, because uh, I actually use them quite a bit uh, whenever I'm in a cafe, or uh, actually I used to go uh, always uh, to visit my parents via train. Mm. Mm. And trains have also Wi-Fi that is unprotected. You can just connect to it. And here in Lithuania, we, we even have trolley buses. Okay, and buses yeah. But they'd have Wi-Fi? They have Wi-Fi. But surely those trips are just a few minutes, right? Yeah, but you still have Wi-Fi, okay. which is really cool. It's everywhere. It's pervasive. <laughs> so have you ever tried looking at a packet capture when you connect to Wi-Fi without, you know, on the back of my laptop, you might have seen uh, PCAP or it didn't happen. This is how we monitor network connectivity, um, particularly when we want to see what's happening on the wire. Okay. And it's super interesting to see what you can learn about your own. You're not snooping on other people, hopefully. But if, if you want to check out how your connection can be seen by others, whether they're authorities, governments, or the people just running the Wi-Fi, or even just other users on your Wi-Fi network, you can use a, a packet capture tool, a PCAP uh, tool, and, and you can just see each packet as it passes, and you'll see that the addresses that you visit can be viewed. Um, they can uh, they can also see the Wi-Fi frames, and uh, hopefully they won't actually get your passwords as long as you're going through HTTPS, right? Uh, yeah. So, but is it just uh, and, and this can happen on like public Wi-Fi? Mm. Uh, but uh, you've tried it on your own where there's a password. Would you have to enter a password? You or can do it on your own when you know the password. Okay. But unless you're hacking the other person's password, which is a different game, then hopefully you won't actually look inside their Wi-Fi. But that risk is always there. You know, if you've given a friend your Wi-Fi password, say a couple of years ago, and you know how Apple phones can just send the password to another device, oh, yeah. you don't know who actually has access to your Wi-Fi. So that risk is always there. Yeah, and, and also, especially if some people don't switch their phones very often or, or upgrade their phones, Android as well has this feature where they save all the networks that, you, that you've had. And there's a new feature, uh, I believe started in, on Android 11, where you can also, uh, also as you said, share like via mm, QR code. Mm. And this can be printed. And people can connect to it as well. Yeah, so. and also saving to the cloud, like on your Amazon Fire Stick and different TV streaming devices. There's always this option. And, you know, it looks very convenient because, you know, it's so annoying typing in your Wi-Fi password oh, with that noise. little keyboard and two buttons. Oh, my God, I hate But it. yet, for me, I haven't got past that trust barrier where <laughs> I would personally send my Wi-Fi to the company. But I'm pretty sure my fr family members have already done this. So probably when it comes to my home network, I'm, I'm not sure it could be hit and miss. Do you believe that, because this is an idea that I had for a while, that anything that stay, uh, you know, is ever put on the internet stays on the internet forever? Do you believe that? Well, to an extent, it's probably true. I mean, with um, GDPR, it's not meant to be the way when mm -hmm. personal information but realistically, you know, you look at the way some big data centers store data, they use almost write-only technology where you write once and then it stays on that, on that drive. And then they have like a sweep phase where they, they will just delete that data at the end of the month or something. But delete doesn't actually mean delete. It just means that that bit of data is flagged for deletion later on. So stuff stays around. And when it goes on the internet, then you have the archive, the internet archive. You have all this different type of collection and storage. So it's kind of high risk. I mean, it's a problem if you're looking at doxing, you know, that kind of side as well, if, if you've got personal data that's leaked. Yeah, laws are getting, you mentioned GDPR, which is, again, uh, something that uh, I think Europe is taking a stride to move forward to delete a lot of the uh, data collection that's out there. But it gets tricky because in the US, it's, uh, it's only in certain uh, states. I believe California has their law. Um, but yeah, it's something to think about as well. Um, now, uh, Lastly, I, I just wanted to mention that Surfshark has a lot of the features that can really also accelerate your protection online. It's like one of my favorite one is the kill switch, is that it will automatically disable your internet connection whenever a VPN server drops, you know, because that, that can happen. You know, servers do sometimes, uh, uh, you know, uh, just drop and, and then or go offline. Uh, and that will prevent any sort of data leaking. So if you want to be with a VPN 24-7, this is the way to do it. You'd have to use skill switch. And another feature I, I really wanted to mention uh, is the alert feature. Um, now, what it does is it will actually scan all the databases uh, where you ever used your uh, credit card information or, uh, especially for me, email. And 
there I have this issue. This is uh, I don't know if you can relate to that, but for certain things I I like to use the same email. But your whole digital life is then in that email address. <laughs> yes, and that's the issue. And, and I I fell into this issue uh, this problem uh, you know uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, I realized that when I typed in my uh, email into the Surfshark alert, it gave me a list, and I have to scroll through to see how many things were breached with that email and I had to go change my password and it was like a lot of things. So that's another uh, you know great feature that uh, you can use with Surfshark and it really helps me out. Um, yeah, let's move on to some of the things that maybe you can also comment about. And uh, there's ton, an absolute ton of regions where uh, people don't have access to the internet. I mentioned China a lot, actually. I talk about China a lot because uh, uh, back when I was used to working in the support team here at Surfshark, we had a lot of Chinese uh, users come in and they say, I cannot access YouTube. I cannot access a lot of the stuff that, you know, to maybe more of the Western audience, it, it's common sense, you know, Google. It's, it's okay, I can access it. Or YouTube, it's, it's normal, right? But but there's also places like Iran is, has been in the news lately. So how does this exactly happen? How, how do these, uh, is it ISPs that block all the content? How is it done? Do you know about that? Yeah, so I mean, internet censorship is a huge problem around the world. And when we talk about the internet, it's the case that there isn't even really one internet. We've just got different networks talking to each other. So, I mean, the original idea with the internet was that each node was supposed to be interconnected. So you could contact any other node, sometimes through hops, but obviously governments, they don't get on with each other. There are conflicts, wars, and, and mm -hmm. crises. And, and these links are broken. But users still need to get online. They still need to get onto YouTube. But yeah, more seriously, journalists need to report. They need to get the news. Sometimes human rights violations are underreported because of the censorship. And there need to be ways to get that information to flow out so that the world can know what's happening. And in these cases, um, the use of VPNs has actually been very effective in connecting activists around the world. It's not always the solution. There's some challenges. Some countries even try to target VPNs to make sure uh, that oh, yeah. those don't work either. But... Uh, certainly in some contexts, uh, they can be very useful. And also there's another aspect of this. There are governments that will use information that they collect in terms of the sites you visit. So let's say you are visiting, I don't know, a human rights site, mm -hmm. Human Rights Watch or Amnesty, and they see that. They may flag you as an activist or potential activist and then start surveilling you in real life. You know, it's not just about the censorship, but it's also about the monitoring that happens. The technology is very similar. It's called deep packet inspection, okay. which looks at the headers of your internet packets. Uh, and this is something that is happening, not just actually in, in I suppose, authoritarian leaning countries, but this technology is prevalent as well in the West, it's in the US, it's, it's in the UK and many EU countries because, uh, you know, technology originally uh, was introduced to prevent uh, like content like child abuse content. But yeah. over time, it gets used for purposes that it wasn't intended to be used for and is, is used to then track people as well. So using a VPN can actually help protect against this kind of overreaching by governments and perhaps even helps protect your constitutional rights and your legal rights in the system. And uh, especially where you specialize in ALP is, uh, you know, internet shutdowns and things like that. And also, you know, journalism work as well. Um, uh, you know, protecting your identity and protests. And uh, why are... You know, overall, internet is powerful, and controlling the internet can lead to. I mean, you can really control the your citizens, wherever your country is based, using the internet. Yeah, I mean, think about it. You look like ten years, twenty years ago, and people had alternative means to communicate, right? I mean, even if you remember some of the war reporting, they would have satellite videos, and that information would actually work. You, you could communicate without the government's help. Now we rely so much on government networks, on uh, on this control. All our telecommunications goes through the ISP, right? Mm -hmm. The internet providers. So we're much more reliant on this than we were before. And then you look at internet communications and you realize internet access is a fundamental human right. This is something we believe in a lot at Netbox in our reporting. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not just a utility. It goes beyond that because it's the way you access all other human rights. It's part of your fundamental rights as, as a person on, on this planet. So, 
But I'm thinking, can ISPs, do they have to obey to what the government is saying, telling them to do? If the government says, okay, your ISP, you're operating within our country, and you know the country decides, we're going to shut off YouTube. You know, it's hard Do they have to yeah. comply with that? Around the world, we've seen that ISPs, internet providers, are pushing back against orders, sometimes even at personal risk. I mean, we've, we've tracked cases, um, individual cases that we've verified where uh, those internet provider staff have been pressured um, at, at, at gunpoint to actually censor online content. And this obviously this happens in environments where there's already a crisis, where there's mm -hmm. a conflict or an uprising. But the problem is that legal challenges and also challenges to the companies themselves mean that the company could get shut down if it doesn't comply with these orders. Mm -hmm. So it's not for granted that a, a company can simply say no. It's also just the, the amount, the sheer number of orders that they receive from governments uh, actually checking each one and validating it can be a lot of pressure for smaller companies. So, uh, yes, this happens sometimes. There's still hope, especially in, in the U.S., in, in the West, in the mm. EU. But it's, it's not a granted that your, your ISP is going to look out for you. If the Internet is a right for every, every human out there, I'm thinking maybe there is a way to access it without having to use a third party like an ISP. Well, the dream is to get fully decentralized, right? I mean, well, <laughs> why? I'm going to send you a message. Why does my message need to go all the way through the internet, perhaps go halfway across the world, and then mm -hmm. jump back to you about 30 centimeters away, Well, that's a good away, question. Right? Yeah, that's a good question. Why does it have to do that? Well, it's because I think the big companies do like having some control over how the packets flow, right? Mm. I mean, if all these devices were to communicate with one another, you'd have a global mesh. In theory, this is possible. But it's also very scary to companies because it means there's no centralized control. Yeah. And you know that those radio chips are very tightly controlled, mm -hmm. especially on Apple devices, but even on Google's and, and Android's devices, that they're, they're not accessible to developers. So you can't actually write code as a developer that will freely communicate with the next iPhone uh, next to you. And the internet was originally built to be that way, to be this mesh like you, you talk about, right? Yeah, the idea was to be nuclear proof, nuclear war proof. Yeah, that's so how it started. Uh, bits would be yeah. ch ch uh, knocked out and you still communicate. But we're not there yet. You know, we see a fire at a data center and then half half the world suddenly doesn't have their social media. So there are still uh, huge challenges. And maybe that's part of the problem with, you know, the commercial nature of these massive platforms and the way they're data collection driven as well mm -hmm. uh, so it does touch on privacy and rights uh, let's talk about uh from a security perspective about mac versus pc and i'll tell you right now i've actually never used a mac before well i did use a mac before back in like 2015 ish and i i used it because my friend bought it but i was also always like a windows guy mm -hmm. um and, and so yeah uh but but from a security perspective uh, and i know windows is getting a lot of flack for online data collection, you know, since Windows 10 days, they've mm -hmm. been collecting so much data. So an another security tip, if you are using Windows, we might actually be making a video on how you can prevent a lot of the, uh, you know, data collection, uh, which is, I think, would be very useful to people because you'd be surprised how much stuff Windows wants to know about you. They, they even have, like, this uh, one of the uh, parameters is actually, like, media activity mm. where they will actually monitor what, like, movies or videos you watch. And they will send those to, I believe, the, you know, Windows, cloud, whatever. And uh, they will try to, you know, they mostly use it for they ads. They say it's for recommendations and yeah. sometimes subtitles and things like that. But do you but know? they are like, collecting yeah. what you're doing and they know where it's from and who mm -hmm. you bought it from, if you bought it. So <laughs> it's stuff you may or may not want to be transmitting. To and it's something that I think Apple doesn't do. Like I've never n never had a pop-up on, uh, you know, on, on, my, on my Mac saying like, oh, would you like us to collect this data? And I'm sure Apple, you know, they're not innocent either. You know, they also have like um, um, some kind of collection, you know, privacy going on. Yeah, I mean, Apple is more privacy-minded because mm -hmm. it's, makes, it's their business differentiator right yeah. now. And honestly, I believe that manufacturers and, and, you know, these companies should consider this aspect. And some of them do. Even Windows, they will say, we care about your privacy. But the way Apple does it, I think they make it a feature. 
Mm. Instead of making it a you know a bothering thing like oh like like these pop ups and things like that, instead they they say we care about this and they install these little features like you know little lights on this MacBook they, they will turn green when when you know things are going on. So yeah, uh, I mean it's compelling. You know, I I do trust to a degree things that Apple are doing. Sometimes they do it by locking down hardware, so it's actually more closed. Yeah. Like, uh, it's a real struggle if you want to dual boot, install Linux on there, get oh, Ubuntu yeah. running. But, if you can work within that walled garden, it's it's a pretty, it's by default, probably more secure. Mm -hmm. One of the yes. disappointing things about Windows is they still have this two-tiered system, where if you use the home edition, you don't get the, uh, uh, the, the, the yes. encryption on the drive, which I think is such an own goal, you know, it's it's fail. Why are you doing this? The people who need it most are the people who perhaps can't afford or don't want to get the, the pro and and uh, enterprise editions. Like, yeah. what are they thinking with this? For the longest time, yeah, if you wanted to get that encryption, mm. you needed to have the pro. And this was true, I think, since Windows XP or something. So, uh, and even, I think on Windows 7, you had to use Ultimate. Yeah, did they improve that now with 11? Uh, actually, I believe no. Still. You still have to, if you want to get, uh, uh, you know, the the uh, I forgot what it's called actually, uh, but it ha it has a name. Bit Locker. Bit Locker. That's yes. right. Uh, so if you want to use Bit Locker, I believe you still need Windows 11 Pro. So yeah. it's one of the ways that they you know push you to upgrade if you don't have Pro. But uh, but yeah. You know, my recommendation would definitely improve a notch if they just simply ship that. Would they lose business? Probably not. They'd probably just be helping people not get involved in so many ransomware situations. Oh, yes. they got to change that policy. So, yeah. But if you want to stay extremely, uh, you know, secure, Linux is the way to go, probably. Yeah. and But why, I think, is an interesting <laughs> thing. Now, sure, it's about the engineering and the quality of the OS. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also partly because of the kinds of ways that people use their Windows. Okay, yes. people are going to be playing more games. Oh, yeah. They may be pirating some software in cases which can be a risk because there's a higher chance mm. that there is a virus or a Trojan in that download if it's not actually purchased from the vendor. Whereas that kind of practice isn't so common on Mac or Linux. Mm. So yes, it's about the inherent security of the OS, but it's also about the ways that people use those operating systems. As yeah, well. and, and, and people will use whatever they're used to, right? So if uh, I'm used to Windows and I'm used to you know gaming on it, whatever, you move to Linux, you use you you lose a lot of the games because there there's a website I think called Proton DB, mm. and you will notice a bunch of games are not accessible on Linux, and most of it is because of the anti cheat systems which use the kernel. Uh, so I think not all of them are optimized for it. That's why mm. they just they don't they're not there. But also the, the user base is so small. Yeah, you know so, I've been a developer for many years on on the Linux desktop. Okay, so, so <laughs> I, I worked on the GNOME desktop. Okay. Um, trying to make that user interface really the world's best desktop operating <laughs> system and make that available for free so that it could be used in, in communities around the world. And I don't think we managed in the end to get that out there on, on every desktop, but in a way it didn't mm. matter because the web became the open platform. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But but yeah, but I actually, I will uh, try to use Linux more. I, I do want to try it out. Um, but uh, maybe we'll make it a series or something like, uh, you know, I try Linux and see how it goes. Uh, actually, Linus Tech Tips, which is a very popular channel, uh, we watch them a lot here. Um, they made a, where they switched to Linux and they were having a lot of issues. I heard it didn't work. I, it I didn't work. The fallout. Yeah, yeah, because uh, they were facing a lot of sound issues, you know, proprietary hard, like software. Because a lot of these, you know, even like this microphone and things like that, like certain uh, certain devices just work because there's drivers for it, you know? And, and again, uh, as much as it pains to say, but Linux user base is extremely small. Um, but actually, on that note, uh, here at Surfshark, we did develop the GUI app uh, for Linux, which was a big, big, big uh, request from us, uh, for us. And, uh, and, and people are extremely happy. Uh, I think uh, in the Linux community, uh, you know, they are very appreciative when you provide them something. And, and I think that was the case when NVIDIA uh, for the longest time, they didn't want to provide drivers and, and, and code for Linux, but eventually they did. And I think the relationship has been getting better now. Yeah, it's it's, it's a bit of a myth that all Linux users use the command line. It's nice <laughs> to put out some desktop <laughs> utilities and options at least. You know, it's also good to have the, the option to do it yourself manually. Oh, so yeah. I, well, that's one thing I like about the Surfshark instructions is there is that manual setup guide. Oh. <laughs> uh, you know, so many... 
uh, organization, they'll miss that and they just say install this exe file and just be done with it. But yeah. maybe you want to wire your VPN your own way. Maybe you yeah. want to set up your own routing rules. Mm, maybe you want bits mm -hmm. of your LAM to be accessible. Yeah. Maybe you want your local uh, local country networks to be available. Locally, you can set up all these custom routes if yeah. you if you set up your own uh, VPN. So that's pretty cool to have those instructions. Yeah. Well, Alp, that was uh, an awesome show. Thank you for joining. And tell us uh, where people can find you. Great. Yeah. Follow us. We're um, Netblocks on Twitter, Facebook, Telegram, and Instagram, and uh, Netblocks.org. We're mapping internet freedom around the world. Awesome. And uh, yeah, subscribe to Surfshark Academy for more shows and follow us on Spotify as well. And uh, that'll be it for this uh, episode of the Surfshark Wave podcast. Thank you for joining and we'll see you later.